Welcome to the Admiralty, the London home of the Raider Nation. Raider Nation, unite. Welcome, everyone. I'm JT The Brick from Silver and Black Productions. Neil Reynolds of Sky Sports joins me today. We have an epic event with Raider legends of the past as we preview this Sunday game at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium against the Chicago Bears. My good friend, good to see you again. JT, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm guessing this, we are on home soil. I'm on home soil, but this is a Raiders town now, right? Yes. London's a Raiders town. Uh, yeah, fantastic to have the silver and black back here. Uh, third time playing a regular season game. Hopefully third time lucky, but this has always been one of the best supported teams in the UK. You know, what's interesting, I went to the stadium on Tuesday night mm. to see Bayern Munich versus Tottenham. It was the greatest stadium I might have ever been to. I was so blown away with that stadium. I think the Raiders are honored to right. open up the stadium for the NFL and play here. Yeah, it's absolutely stunning. And, and I think the, the historic nature of the stadium shouldn't be overlooked. The Tottenham Hotspur team went to the NFL and said, what do you want? What can we build for you so that you bring NFL games here? So it's the first purpose-built NFL stadium outside of North America. It's going to be the perfect setting. Passionate fans from both teams will be there. Yeah, that's why it's such a hot ticket. I can't wait. I want to toast the silver and black in the UK as they are taking over London and we get this party going. <laughs> there we go. He is one of the greatest Raider legends of all time. We welcome in number 43, the ferocious George Atkinson. Not only a Super Bowl champion, but one of the greatest Raider teammates of all time, my good friend George Atkinson. Great to see you, George. It's a pleasure being here. What a turnout. Hey, yeah, Raider fans. <laughs> Raiders! <laughs> George, wow. you really enjoy these trips. Last time you were here, you embraced it. You embraced these fans. You're at the team hotel, you're at practice, but when you get a chance to come into London and see these fans, what's that like? Oh man, it's amazing, you know, coming all the way across the water to see that the Raiders have such a large fan base here, and it's a, definitely a pleasure for the team to play here. And it's exciting for the players to play here because you're playing, although the Raiders are the home team, we're still in a away game in a sense. But we got, with fans like these, we're going to give you a good <laughs> show. Now, George, we love the, the mystique of the Raiders. I think that's why they're such a popular team amongst the, the UK fans. Uh, and I think we appreciate the fact that you once got called for two penalties on the same play, I think that's kind of what... Doesn't that just sum up the Raiders? Uh, without doubt. <laughs> More than once that happened. I bet that happened a few times. <laughs> Tell us what it's like now about uh, being around the team. Obviously, you played for the team for so long, but now working... Uh, in that kind of football personnel department, how special it is to still be around uh, the game. Very much so, you know, still be a part of the organization. Uh, I came to the Raider organization in 1968 wow, yes. <laughs> and been a part of it ever since. And right now I'm doing what's called special projects, kind of. I do the AFC West and I do the teams and I, uh, I, I do reports on the players on, on the AFC West. When you're watching that film, do you sometimes look and say, I'm watching a very, very different game? It is a different game yeah. because when we played, you could really run through players. <laughs> you know, you could hit. Now it's kind of a grab and pull down kind of a deal. And uh, the rules are, are, are quite strict. Uh, we saw evidence of that uh, last week right. when uh, Burford got, got suspended for a year, which I thought was quite severe. And, uh, yeah. But the game, the game has changed, and it's, it's for the protection of the players, but it's, it's changed quite a bit. Yeah. George, let's go back to the win against Indianapolis. Eric Harris had the pick six to ice that game. He put the game away. A safety interception by Harris to win that game. What improvements have you seen on the defense, especially on the back end, with Joyner and Harris and the way they play? Well, Harris brings something different to the table. He's a communicator. He's a leader. He's... He's played before, he's a veteran, and uh, he, he brings that stability to the secondary. Uh, I think they're getting better and better each, each week. 
And if they continue to improve, the defense is going to be definitely special. No doubt the pass rush plays a big role. You had one of the greatest pass rushes throughout your career. It gave you the ability with Jack Tatum and all your teammates to jump routes and make big plays. Do you think Paul Gunther and his scheme is now starting to come together? Oh, without a doubt. I think the, the scheme is starting, he's starting to fit players into this scheme, and uh, it's a good scheme. Like you say, you got to get a, a pass rush from up front, and the linebackers are playing pretty good. That's important, too, especially in stopping the run. You want to stop the run so you force teams to throw right. the football. And uh, with the secondary developing as it is, I think that pass rush is, is going to cause some problems. We can look at the X's and O's or any scheme in football, and that part of it is important. But also intensity, George, is important. And we've seen this defense flying around as well. Is that something that's pleased you to see? Because obviously, I guess that can be coached, but that's just onto the players to have that intensity. Yeah, that's instinctive from the players. You know, you, you definitely want energy. You, you want to see guys flying around trying to make plays. Yeah. And, and uh, this defense is starting to come together. You got to keep in mind a lot of these guys haven't played together. And it's a young right. defense when you look at it. You know, you look at the defensive line, you got two rookies right. that's, that's playing regular there. So it's starting to gel. It's starting to come together. The guys are getting to know each other. That's very important in any team setting. You definitely have to know each right. other, and you got to know who you're, who, who's playing next to you. Mm. Yeah. George, it's going to be a really upbeat day today, as you know, but I want to end it on a really important note. Your memory of Cliff Branch, one of your greatest friends, one of the greatest Raiders to ever play the game. We all wish he was here today. What can you tell the Raider Nation about Cliff? Oh, Cliff was a dedicated Raider, a Raider for life. Uh, he and I were roommates for eight years. Uh, we did a lot of things together. We had a lot of fun. Cliff was the guy that had, you talk about energy. Oh, yeah. This guy had so much energy, it was unbelievable. It's, you know, it's, it's, it was a sad day when he passed away, but in his heart, he was always a Raider forever. You ask, that's the thing with you guys. I think it strikes me compared to other NFL teams. I know the phrase, once a Raider, always a Raider, but exactly. it really applies to you. You, uh, you legends of the team. You really oh, well, are close to the team. Without a doubt. Uh, and that once a Raider, always a Raider, that's, that's not just a cliche or what have right. you. It's a fact. And uh, as you well know, JT, JT's a Raider also. Hey, I got the once shirt a Raider, now. You I got the shirt now, George. <laughs> <laughs> right. Once a Raider, always oh, a Raider. Now, George, I think we want to do this. Please stand up right here. Please stand up. Hey, Raider Nation, get a photo. Get a photo. Raider. <laughs> photo up. Stand there, George, and wait for him. There you go. Raider. When we come back, one of the great Raider running there backs of all time when we continue from the London Admiral Raiders. Team. Welcome back to the Admiralty, the home of the Raider Nation in London. Raider Nation. What a legend and guest we have for you. The great Mark Van Egan played for the Silver and Black from 74 to 81, a two-time Super Bowl champion, and he joins us in London. Good to see you, my friend. How are you? <laughs> How you doing, Mark? Uh, I'm doing just fine. My, uh, this is just, I've never been here before. It's, uh, I don't think I want to go back anytime soon. <laughs> Everybody's been so wonderful, and we're having a time of our lives. With your Providence roots and your New England roots, I'm very surprised you haven't been here. It feels like it's part of your DNA with your wife. You've been having an unbelievable trip. Oh, we are. Uh, we are. Uh, thankfully, we have a ch we've had a chance uh, to have some free time. Not that this is awesome, but we've been... Uh, looking around and stuff. I'm a history buff, so I'm in heaven, uh, looking at some of the things that I've been reading about. And back in the US, I mean, things are 200 or 300 years old. Over here, they're, <laughs> they're a few centuries, you know? So I'm, I'm loving it to death, and everybody's been so nice to us. Well, has it surprised you, the, the passion for the NFL among the British fans? And you'll see that tomorrow at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. This great support here today at the Admiralty as well. I, 
I know that the, the, the league has been trying to get right. our, our brand over here. Yeah. Uh, um, I haven't uh, seen it with my own eyes until here. Yeah. And it's unbelievable. And it's wonderful to, to, to see. It, it's awesome. Mark, there's an unbelievable connection with you through Marv Hubbard, Al Davis, and Colgate. How did you go from being a high school star, get to Colgate, and then find yourself in the famed Silver and Black? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, uh, you don't go to, uh, with all due respect to Colgate, it's not your basic football factory. Very nice, very good uh, uh, school back, back home. Uh, small school, we played us. Uh, I, I didn't play Michigan and Ohio State and all those big teams. I, I just played my schedule. I wanted to continue to. I wanted to continue to play football past high school. But I had no thought, not one even dream of NFL. You, you wouldn't have gone to go to Colgate if you wanted to have that happen to you. You just wouldn't have. But I, I guess uh, Mr. Davis, Mr. Al Davis at the time, um, he, uh, my predecessor there, Marv Hubbard, was also from Colgate. He must, we both had the same head coach. He must have uh, interviewed uh, Neil Wheelwright, uh, who was the head coach at the time. I, in fact, Neil told me uh, that they, they came to talk to him and Neil must have spoken well of me in comparison to uh, someone who had uh, had quite a reputation, you know, with yeah. Oakland. So I think that's how it all uh, all went down. But I was um, flabbergasted and uh, surprised, and I said, "Okay, why not? Let's and, give it a shot." And you were <laughs> right oh, tell me about playing for the Raiders and some of the colorful characters on the team. You had Ted Hendricks riding naked to practice on a horse, the stuff with Kenny Stabler studying by the light of the jukebox. It must have been fun, but it must have been... I mean, did anyone respect curfew? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, I, I, I remember, uh, I remember uh, Kenny coming in. We were at a, a, on an away trip, a, a three time zone away trip, and and uh, so we uh, had to leave two days early for the game. Right. So we're, we're, uh, they kind of were loosey-goosey about checking, bed check that first <laughs> night. So I see, I see uh, Stabler, Snake, the next morning, and he looks like you-know-what right. coming in. And, and I wasn't feeling so good myself, but I knew I had another, another night to get my sleep and get ready. And I said, Snake, geez. Um, When'd you get in? Just getting in, Mark. <laughs> At 7.30 in the morning. But you know something? I laughed my butt off. That man, he had a reputation for whatever. He never once let us down, no matter what. Yeah, and I guess uh, that was not, important. Not, no, not one time uh, did he let us down because of maybe... Uh, staying out too late. So that was just a story I like to tell. Yeah, they're fun, sto they're fun stories and they are part of pro yeah. football legend. They make it all the way across here to the Atlantic. But the fact is, you guys just won baby. So you kind of, that was the, you know, just win baby was the motto and, and you guys did that. So I guess they were allowed to give you some freedom a little bit. Yeah, yeah, they did. Uh, uh, and, and Coach Madden, um, you know, you didn't want to, oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't want to, um, oh, geez, do anything egregiously wrong. Right. But they, John, talking about John Mad now. <laughs> yes. He just, he just loved a good, a good laugh. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I mean right. and a good story. That's right. A real short one. We had, um, we had a, a, a very huge defensive end. I, it was my third or fourth year. I and. His name was Charles Filio, and he was a massive defensive end. And uh, I'm trying to, I want to be polite. I, I, maybe he didn't get 800 on his AT, SATs or something. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, 
So anyway, he he was on our he was on our uh, team a couple of years. One day at practice, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I I see him walking up to Coach Madden on the sideline of a practice of a practice, and all of a sudden, Madden just howls, just as laughing his butt off right in the middle of practice, and he and he. And he came, and he and he he gave me the the signal. Hey, Van, come on, come on over here, come see me. He said, you know, you know what Charlie just said. He he asked, uh, why do, why does he get both names on his jersey? <laughs> you, I, can't, I can't make this up. You can't make that I can't, up. I can't make that up. <laughs> and and that's with. Uh, Complete respect to Charlie. Sure, I, I, but but we 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 had fun. We we uh, we played hard for Mr. Davis, for John Madden. We didn't leave anything anything. Did we uh, have a good time and enjoy ourselves uh, in, a, in a in a in a nice way? I think the community. We supported our community. And uh, we had fun with it. And uh, I'm tickled pink and so proud to be part of this organization. Well, you stay right there because now we have an opportunity to welcome in one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Raider Nation doesn't get any better than the two-time Super Bowl champion, the great Jim Plunkett. Thank you, JT. Hello, Jim. Good to see you in London. How are you? Uh, good to be here. I'm great. Tell me about your teammate, Mark Van Egan. Well, we were fortunate enough, or I was fortunate enough, to play in the Super Bowl with Mark, uh, a guy you can always depend on, whether it be blocking or running the football. Uh, it was a great time for me. You know, I'd been with New England, been with the Niners, finally got a chance to play with some really fine players. And, you know, Mark, of course, being one of them, but, you know, Gene Dupshaw, Art Shell, uh, Cliff Branch, uh, Coach Madden, and Mr. Davis put a great team together. Mark, I want to ask you about your friend Jim Plunkett. When you knew he was coming to the team, the type of leadership he brought, what was that about? Oh, gosh. Again, Colgate, Stanford, <laughs> uh, and, and all of his past. Uh, my job was not to let a linebacker touch him if if I could help it. I if only that had happened. I didn't care if I tackled the damn guy but and get, a, and get called for a hold of it. Nobody was touching our quarterback. But in all seriousness, uh, um, again, from my background, I don't want to overplay it, but I'm playing with, as my teammates, a guy like Jim that's just a regular guy, talks to me like he does his other buddies, and... Uh, you know, I was one of the group, uh, one of the one of the team, very quickly, uh, and it felt awesome. They were wonderful. Jim, we talk now a lot about balance in the NFL, running and throwing, and having that type of balance. What was it like when you played initially with this group, knowing you had a great running game from fullbacks to running backs, great tight ends and wide receivers, and the balance of these game plans that you were a part of? Well, still back in the day, kind of, so to speak, it was... Uh, trying to run the football first, almost always. Uh, but Mr. Davis, and I had Coach Flores, uh, really didn't play under John Madden, uh, but we were always looking for that opportunity to get the ball down the field, whether it be Cliff Branch, Raymond Chester, uh, Bobby Chandler, uh, somebody. But when I first got there, it was still running the football for the, for the most part, and uh, until, uh, uh, Marcus Allen got there. It was it was a foot uh, a fullback dominated offense right. running the football, and you know obviously Mark was a was a big part of it here. Give me yeah. both a memory of preparation for Super Bowl 15. What do you remember on how loose you were heading into that game and how you were peaking at the right time? What were you thinking? Well, I can tell you uh, for that first Super Bowl, the one against Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> I. I I, uh, one of my, everybody's, everybody was good friends with each other. One of, uh, besides George Atkinson and, and Skip Thomas, uh, Jack Tatum, the rest is so, 
was a very good friend and used to bust my chops a lot. And um, I, I must have been uh, a little tense, you know, because I was sitting in the locker. I must have been sitting in the locker just looking like I lost my best friend or something. And maybe it was my way of getting ready or he was thinking that maybe I was being overwhelmed. He knows my past. Yeah. Now I'm all about Colgate, Super Bowl. I mean, one and one doesn't make two in that equation, right? And he looked at me, he, he, he looked at me and just howled, just broke out in such laughter that it, it totally broke the trance I was in, you know, kind of getting mentally ready for it. And he got me laughing and he gave me a dope slap upside the head and said, you're gonna have a good, great game. It helped. That's how our veteran players nope. knew how they could help somebody like me in this case, um, you know, get ready for a game. Jim, your memory of Super Bowl 15 in preparation coming in. Uh, well, you know, we, everybody tried to focus on the upcoming game. Obviously, it was a big game for me. It was 10 years before I even got into the playoffs. And that was 1981, 80-81 season. And getting to the Super Bowl for me was a long, hard struggle. And my preparation, you know, I stayed in my room for the most part, uh, getting ready to play this game. They'd beaten us once during the regular season. We had to come back and get them. Uh, but, you know, I played with a group of guys, you know, Mark here included, but Ted Hendricks, John Matusak, uh, Bobby Chandler, names I've mentioned already, guys who had been there, you know, they were relaxed. They were ready to take... Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles on, uh, even though they beat us during the regular season, we felt we had a much better game plan going into this one. And, you know, I can't say enough about the way the uh, team, the offensive line protected for me, enabling me to get to the ball, get the ball out to the receivers. You know, time after time, Kenny King runs it down the sideline for 80 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Bobby Chandler had a big game. Cliff had a big game. Uh, and the defense just stuffed Philly. And uh, that's, what's, that's what you call payback. Go ahead, Mark. One more memory about yeah. that. And it was, for, it was about my good friend, Clarence Davis, my running back mate. We were a fullback uh, uh, oriented, I should say, running game. Clarence blocked for me at least, at least twice as t many times as I ever blocked for you. But that game, the Minnesota defense set up for me to be a lead blocker instead of Clarence. Clarence led the game in rushing for both sides. In my opinion, should have been the NFP MVP with all due respect to Freddie Blitnikoff who got it. Uh, you know what I'm saying. I, I don't mean any disrespect, but I, I, when I look back on my career, I was so proud and so happy for my running mate on the biggest stage that there can be, that I just that, that that happened, and and it was and it was in the Rose Bowl too, where he played all of his games. Unbelievable, Jim. You stay there, Mark Van Egan. Please stand up right here, so everybody can get a photo of one of the all-time great legends, well, two-time Super Bowl champion, the great Mark Van Egan, Raider Nation. Thank you, everybody. When we come back. More with great Raider legends from the Admiralty at Trafalgar Square oh right God. here in downtown London. Welcome back to the Admiralty in the heart of London at Trafalgar Square. Raider Nation, raise a glass. We're talking to Jim Plunkett. Listen, I grew up watching this guy, watching Marcus Allen in the backfield. I mean, the Raiders were huge here in the 80s. You're in a bubble in the NFL. You probably didn't even know how big you were globally um, you know, with the Super Bowls and all of that. But what do you make of the growth of the game here internationally? I think it's been tremendous. I've been here the last three games with the Raiders, including this one. Uh, a great turnout. You, you people get people from mainland Europe here. Uh, people from Dubai were here. Right. They're all from all over. I met some people from the, uh, the Netherlands and Germany today, the yeah. big Raider group from Germany. Um, and... You know, the Raider insignia, the Raider team, Mr. Al Davis, 
you know, they're no, known worldwide, uh, and it's a fantastic following they have all over, not only the United States, but all over the world. Jim, as an analyst on the Silver and Black show, when you break down the tape of John Gruden's offense, how complex is it? And is Derek Carr picking it up better in his second year? Oh, I, I, I'm absolutely sure, positive that that's the case. You know, he's got a better grasp of what's going on out there on the football field uh, under uh, Coach Gruden. Uh, and Greg Olson, I think, is a, a great offensive coordinator. He's helping and working with uh, Derek to make him a better quarterback in this kind of offense. You know, the game has changed so much. It's a spread offense, very little fullback involved. Uh, find your guy, get him the ball, let him make plays down the field, uh, and that will help Derek out tremendously. But getting rid of the ball is key in this game. This Darren Waller, this tight end is something. He's so athletic, he can line up on the outside, on the inside. What have you seen so far on how they're using him with the game plan? Uh, spectacularly. You know, he's all over the field, inside, outside, as you mentioned. Can get down the field for a big man or can play kind of a tight end role as well. Uh, and he's, he's off to a great start. Something like 33 catches, I'm not sure. But somewhere around there in four games. And that's tremendous for a tight end. I think that's the exciting thing about this team. When I was at Raiders training camp last year, there were about 12 guys on the roster that had 10 years or more experience. That's pretty much gone now. You've got Josh Jacobs, you've got Darren Waller, you've got the young guys on the defensive line. I mean, you can kind of see what uh, Coach Gruden and Mike Mayock are building here. Yeah, they are building to, uh, you know, obviously to be a better ball club. And these guys have to grow up fast, right. you know. Yes. They've <laughs> got to go out there. There's, there's no time out. There's no time to take a breath. Uh, each and every down, they've the got NFL. to get a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've got to be ready to go. But sure, it's a learning process. Right. And Coach Gruden's trying to get them to learn as fast as they possibly can. Is he quite old school when you look at coaches from your era and now you look at John Gruden? Uh, yeah, he is kind of old school because he's in-your-face kind of guy, you know. Yeah, yeah. If you're not doing what he asked you to do, uh, he wants to know why, you, and, yeah. he, and he's not shy about it. Yeah. Jim, finally, you have your beautiful wife with you. Your family means so much to you. What has the Raiders done for you post-football career? They say once a Raider, always a Raider. You've given so much to this organization, and it feels like the organization gives right back to you. Uh, it certainly has, starting with Al Davis, uh, you know, letting me become part of the club after I retired, uh, doing radio, doing TV, doing the highlight show. Uh, he, he, you know, he's brought our entire family into the Raider, Raider organization, and that's meant a lot to me. Mark Davis has continued that uh, trend uh, with our family, and uh, it's been great. We've enjoyed the heck out of it, and we'd like to see the Raiders get back to the Super Bowl and many more in the coming years. Jim, please stand up. Ladies and gentlemen, get your cameras out. One of the all-time greats. The legendary, <laughs> the great Jim Plunkett. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Now we bring Good up job, Thank you. one of the all-time great Raider offensive linemen, Wiz, Steve Wisniewski, an eight-time Pro Bowler, and we <laughs> welcome him to the Admiralty in London. Let's hear it, everybody, for Raider royalty. The great Steve Wisniewski. Good to see you, Wiz. Wow. Thank you, JT. It's great to be here. Hello, London. <laughs> Hello, Raider Nation. Let's go get a win. You embrace this. You love this. You got the call to come here, and you couldn't be more excited to come. Tell us about that. Absolutely. The Raiders are family, and they treat us former players like family. And I got a call from... Uh, the uh, Mark Davis's secretary said, "Do you want to come to London instantly?" Yes. Where do I need to go? <laughs> and uh, it's been nothing but positive energy since we've been here. The fans are so appreciative. Just give us an Al Davis story, because you, you're a man, and we've had a great friendship. You're about relationships and building relationships, about your faith, your family, and your friends. When was the first time you ever met Al Davis, and what were your early memories of that relationship? Yeah, you know. It, being brought into Oakland, you, you feel like you're a member of fa a family right <laughs> yeah, away. Right. Yeah. And I remember meeting Mr. Davis for the first time, and I thanked him for the opportunity to come to the Raiders. And I, I was the first pick in the second round. Right. The Raiders actually traded for From me. Dallas. Right. They gave yeah. a few picks to the Dallas Cowboys to move up that year and get me. And I shook his hand, and I said, thank you, Mr. Davis, for the opportunity to be a Raider. Yeah. And I'll never forget, he just looked at me. He said, make me proud. You know, make me proud. 
like uh, make it worthwhile. Yeah. And uh, I, I never took it for granted. I worked my tail off, and he was very much a, a, a player's owner. Right. He knew every position on the field. He would talk to us after practice, and you wanted to win. You wanted to please him, and uh, I wanted to make him proud. It was, a, it was an incredible legacy that he had, and let, you know, to be a, a commissioner, a general manager, a coach, an owner, I mean, it was incredible, and so you probably do really want to make him proud, and it must, you must have been proud when you then went from playing to coaching for the Raiders. Absolutely, and I'll never forget, you know, every meaningful paycheck of my life had the Raider logo on it. Wow. He gave me a great start in life. But there was no other owner like him. I respect all NFL owners, but he's one of the few that actually knew the game of football right. inside and out. Right. Uh, players would often call, to, call him coach, just referring to him <laughs> because he, he was like a coach and yeah, he had been right. a coach yeah. and out of respect. So he actually gave me an opportunity to coach with the Raiders. And again, I wanted to make him proud. I wanted to show him that I knew what I was doing. Yeah. And he, he, again, put confidence back in me. So did you have, during your course of your career, what I'd call genuine football X's and O's conversations with him? Not business conversations, but you and he would talk football, which probably doesn't happen to every player and owner around the NFL. That's right. It, it, it's very rare. But right. with Mr. Davis, it was always talking football. Nice. And he could coach every position. He would ask you about the team you're playing that week, about matchups. And he had done his homework. He yeah. had watched the film. It, it was awe-inspiring. There's not someone in the Raider organization who doesn't have a story of being inspired by Mr. Davis. Well, step up. It's your turn for the fans. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Raider Nation, here he is, one of the all-time greats, the eight-time Pro Bowler, Steve Wisniewski. Thanks, Wiz. Incredible. Thanks, he made man. it out to London. When we come back, more of our conversations with the great legends of the Silver and Black when we continue from the Admiralty, this is Silver and Black Productions. Welcome back to the Admiralty, the home of the Raider Nation in London. Raider Nation, let's hear from you. We are back with two Raider legends, Steve Wisniewski, who just joined us. He'll stay with us for our conversation with the great Lincoln Kennedy. Good to see you, Lincoln. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. I want to begin, first off, with your relationship with Wiz. When you came to this franchise, how important was he to your growth as a player? Very important. The one thing that I take away from Wiz's uh, playing career his overall tenacity. He was the type of guy that wouldn't quit, and he really showed me how football, in my mind, is controlled violence. And what I mean by that, between whistle whistle, everything goes, everything can happen. You do your job at your utmost ability, and Wiz showed me how to do that. I was, un I was unfamiliar with it because, I mean, I had some success, but coming to a team like the Raiders, when I had Kevin Gogan as my guard, we had Dan Turk, Barrett Robbins was just coming on the scene, and we were, we were coached by Joe Bugle. And so Joe just let us do our stuff, let us be ourselves. We had a, a slew of personalities, Robert Jenkins, Pat Harlow. I mean, some of those the offensive lines we came in. I remember specifically one time when um, we were scrimmaging the Cowboys. I think we were in El Paso or one of the Texas cities and uh, during preseason. And so Joe came in the room and he said, look, if one of us fights, we all fight. And Wiz was like, hey, we're going to go, we're going to go. So when you have a, that group of characters, and whenever, you know, you got tired or like, just want to start something, Wiz wouldn't talk anything. He'd just go up there and be a, be a part of it. But we one of us fought, we all fought. If your quarterback does get sacked, how do you feel? Start with you, Wiz. You know what? To me, playing Raider football means you play to the whistle blows. And Lincoln was a great signing for the Raiders. Mm. The minute he got there, he was born to be a Raider because he's a warrior. He's tenacious. I've never seen him take a day off. He was always working, doing more than what was asked. And we believe for 60 minutes it was a street fight. Yeah. And we didn't want anyone to want to line up against us. We wanted to make it a miserable day for the defensive lineman across from us. If our quarterback did get sacked, we would be the guy to help him up, dust him off, pat him up, tell him, hey, it's okay, and we go back to work. Right. To answer your question, I looked at it like this. My quarterback was my girlfriend. You're not touching my girlfriend. <laughs> so I would literally go up to guys and with, with the sort of, you know, mindset, I can't let you get close to my woman. And if you got sacked, I'm mad, especially if it came off my side. I remember one time we were playing the, the Chargers in Oakland, 
and I had got my calls mixed up. I had, I had turned the wrong way. The defensive end came out and sacked Rich, and I went over to pick him up. I was like, Rich, what happened? He was like, you didn't block your guy. I'm like, oh, you're right, I didn't. I missed my guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried to make it up. But, I mean, you know, you don't try. You try not to make those mistakes, but you get up for challenges like this. Right. I thought you made a great point. Lincoln came over from another team and then blossomed into an all-time great pro bowler and great player. Isn't that where the team is at now? As John Gruden broke down the team, is building it up again. I'll start with you, Wiz. When you're trying to bring free agents in like Mike Mayock and John Gruden, they want future Raiders in their mold. What are they actually looking for? Because Mayock now was a TV guy doing this, and John Gruden was out for nine years. What do you think a future Raider player looks like? Yeah, I talked to our general manager, Mike, about that just the other day, and I complimented him. They're looking for players who love the game of football. There's Across the league, there's some players who like the lifestyle of football, but they don't love the X's and O's. So first and foremost, they want players who love the game of football. They want players who are going to play for 60 minutes to the whistle blows and be tenacious. Guys like Lincoln who, you know, and Joe Bugle used to say, bring your lunchbox every day, nine to five ham and eggers, and then they want character guys. They want guys who are gonna show up and be great in the locker room. Another thing I love about Lincoln, not only was he war a warrior, not only did he work hard, become a Pro Bowl player, he was always one of those guys making his teammates better and pumping up his teammates. Your, your opinion on the future of this team, how's it going? I think the, the building blocks are there. You know, I joined the team during the, during the radio a few years back, and I noticed holes in various positions of the team. You know, for example, one of them was the position that I played, which, which was right tackle. And I thought Reggie McKenzie, when he was general manager, had a, 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 a nice philosophy to draft and build up from the foundation, but it just wasn't translating into wins. We're in a performance-based business. And when you have a quarterback as valuable as Derek Carr, you want to make sure he's protected. So that's why they had to go out there and sign players like Trent Brown. You had to fill that right tackle spot. That right tackle spot had been a hole, a blaring hole for the team. So you're talking about a number of players coming in and making an immediate impact. And more importantly, you're trying to build depth, which is also important these days, especially with the new rules of football. Before you go, Wiz, we're going to keep Lincoln with us for a moment. Colton Miller. I love what Colton Miller looks like this year because last year he played hurt. He was banged up. He never complained. He went to treatment. He played in those games where a lot of younger players would have checked out and tried to get healthy. What have you learned watching him play in his first year a couple of games? You know, I had a chance to talk to him this week, and I'm really impressed with that young man. It's not easy. The left tackle is the hardest position on the offensive line. And that kid got thrown in there as a rookie. He didn't complain, but he was playing hurt. He didn't look quite right, and for any rookie, it's a steep learning curve. I like what I see in year two, and uh, I think it's going to be a great year for him. I like his attitude. I love his work ethic. When we come back, we'll bring in another great Raider legend, a recent fullback. We say goodbye to Steve Wisniewski. Thanks so much, Wiz. Lincoln Kennedy will stay with us as Raider Nation. Let's wake up and get this going. We are ready. <laughs> The Raiders are ready. The Bears are not. When we continue on the Raiders Broadcasting Network. I'll tell you, Lincoln Kennedy, I was at that stadium. It is the greatest stadium I've ever been to. And I'm serious. From Lambeau Field to Wembley, the other places where you played and had a great college career. How excited are you to be in the booth with the legendary Brent Musburger? calling a game at this shrine to football here in Europe. Well, I'm just wondering how high they're going to put us. You know, we've, we've had some pretty high <laughs> stadiums, yeah. so I'm wondering how are going to be our vantage point and where they're going to put us. So, But I'm looking forward to it. I, you know, the great thing about these sort of new horizons for the NFL, bringing American football over to Europe, where it had success with the World League back in the day, mm. and you know there's a craving for it. People are getting more and more accustomed to it the more they see it. Is, is a wonderful adventure. And, it, and it's really great for people like us to be ambassadors, to bring the game over, to have the fans come out, to see for, you know, because they have a passion like no other in their version of football. I mean, yeah. you talked about, you went to see a, a soccer match and, and you, you, you remember the crowd that was there. So it is a phenomenal feeling and I'm looking forward to it. Lincoln, if you were a player on this current Raiders team, how would you deal with this extended road trip? It's the longest road trip in NFL history. Last home game in Oakland was September the 15th. Next home game in Oakland will be November the 3rd. It is what it is. You can't change the schedule. So how do you, how do you embrace it and treat it as a player? Well, you know, I wish I was playing and had these opportunities. Right. 
because I know that a lot of people talk about home versus road, but you know, let me just save the trouble. They're treated like rock stars. Right. Right. <laughs> it's not like they're staying in a motel. It's not like in the middle not, seat. You know what right? I mean? It's not. I mean, come on now. It's. I understand you're away from home and you don't have all the luxuries of home, but come on. Where we're at the Grove. Right. I mean, this is a top top rated resort. You know, it's this yeah. is. It's not. It's not hard. It's not a hard okay. life. Okay. Right. The food that we're eating and everything else. Keeping so, it real. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. People have done worse, but you know, the thing is, is that you just have to deal with it. Right. And, and if I was playing at a time like where we came over to London, I know Wiz, when they played, they played in London, they played in Barcelona, I would take full advantage of it. Right. Because there's a new opportunity, a new city to get out and travel, and you're doing it on the company's dime, so why not take advantage <laughs> of it? We talked about this because of the lack of playing time in the preseason. Right. Guys just don't play like they did back in the day with you. Do you think that leads not only to the Raiders, but other teams breaking down a little bit? You know, teams are going into the bye week. They're playing the first quarter of the season. It's tough to stay healthy in this modern era compared to maybe back in the day because they're not getting as many reps. Well, and I totally agree with that. I think that football is a, a game of conditioning. And there's, there's a difference between, say, training a, what a, a, a trainer or a PX90 training and football training. The only way that you get football training is by playing football. And I'm a firm believer that you have your body has to be conditioned to play football. And I, you see today... You know, once upon a time, big guys like me, we never pulled a hamstring or a groin or anything like that. Now you see big guys with soft tissue injuries. That never happened. Lower back issues. Because now what you're asking them to do is instead of doing it during training camp or preseason, you're telling them, hey, put the pads on, go out there and explode right. for three hours over and over again. Right. And then we're talking about recovering and do it over again. You would get a little bit the normal wear and tear that you see. In the first month of the season, collectively by the players, you would get that wear and tear during training camp and preseason if they play. Lincoln, if you can stand up, ladies and gentlemen, the great Lincoln Kennedy, Raider Nation. Here we go. Raider Nation, where you at? I can't hear you. Where you at? Cheers, my friend. Let's get ourselves a win. When we come back. <laughs> Another great member of the Raider Nation, Marcel Reese, joins us when we continue from the Admiralty. Four-time Pro Bowler, former fullback, the great Marcel Reese joins us. Great to see you. Great to see you, JT. How you doing? They love you. They I love, love it, you. man. Nothing like it. <laughs> there is nothing like it. You're having another great trip, not only representing the Raiders, doing a lot of media. I want to jump in right out of the gate. You made that transition from ball player, and it was tough for you to walk away because you have something left. You still look like you can play today, but you've really made a nice jump to broadcasting. Tell us about that. To be honest with you, I just love the game of football. I uh, love talking about the game of football, articulating it to fans, and, and you know, anything that can keep me close to the Raider Nation, I'm all about it. And your preparation as a broadcaster, you put in a lot of time, the work at NFL Network, the work you do at Silver and Black Productions, you take it very seriously. I mean, I have to. That's one of the things I learned here, being in the silver and black, was just preparing and being prepared for anything and uh, being a versatile player and being able to do everything on the field. So I kind of take that to my everyday life and, and life after football and being in a broadcasting game or TV game, just constantly being prepared, be able to do whatever needs to be done. I think a lot of our international fans would like to know how you built that relationship from Mr. Davis to Mark Davis you have this unique reputation where there's a lot of trust there and there's a lot of conversation. Tell us about that. To be honest with you, just me being me as a person, uh, always being honest, uh, saying what's on my mind and never backing down from what I believe in, and also, to, also my loyalty to the Raider Nation. You know, I'm, I'm loyal uh, sometimes to a fault, you know, in life. And uh, that's one thing that, that was instilled in me at a young age, coming from Inglewood, California, is just loyalty over anything. And that's what the Raiders stand for. That's what the Raider Nation is all about. And uh, that's what the late, great Al Davis was all about, loyalty and family. I think the biggest takeaway for me the first four games has been Josh Jacobs. Just to see him as a closer who can end a game, have a breakout run, and then when he's finishing a run, he gets you those extra two or three yards. Assess his play so far. It's one thing when I was evaluating him coming out uh, of college, he... He was so versatile as a player, something that I pride myself in when I was a player, but he does everything it takes to be a great back in this game. Runs between the tackles, can run outside the tackles, has speed, power, and the biggest thing is that he finishes on runs, never runs out of bounds. 
He's looking for the contact to finish. Always falls for. And that's what you need in a, in, a, in a runner in a back in this game. He just has a, a dog about him. I remember when we hosted the, uh, the official Raider uh, draft, draft party, party in Vegas. And I told you that. He just had this, this mental aspect to him that, uh, that separated him from the rest of the running backs in this, in this draft class. I thought, now let's stay with that. I'm happy you brought up that point, the draft class, because Farrell gets taken fourth overall. I was standing with you. And we were talking about the fact that he was the best pure defensive end when Bosa was taken off the board. Really a shame Jonathan Abram got hurt because he just looks like a beast. But you went nuts when they got the running back because clearly the Raiders didn't want to lose out on Josh Jacobs. They had to take him when he was available. They absolutely had to take him. I think uh, the draft was a great draft. Uh, it hurts losing Abram, you know, especially week one. Uh, he, he brought a, a, a certain amount of energy to that defense. He had an attitude about himself. So, so that does hurt us. Injuries are a part of the game, and, and every team has to deal with it. So they've been doing a great job of next man being up. I saw him last night, um, and we had a little dinner with him, his wife and family. He's still supporting the team, and I love seeing that from a young leader on this team. Uh, so the future's looking bright. Now, the John Gruden loves the fullback, right? Likes the two tight ends and the fullback. Who was the toughest edge rusher you ever went up against? And the follow-up question would be, when you knew you had to chip him, your goal was not to catch the ball and run the ball. You had to stop a beast coming off the edge. What's that like? I mean, that's, that's what being a fullback is all about. It's sacrificing yourself for your team and doing whatever you have to do to help your quarterback and be in protection, uh, help your offensive line. And you have to give great pass rushers you know, for me, when, when I was here with the Raiders, we played a ton of different pass rushes in the AFC West, from the Sean Merriman when he was at the top of his game, and the Sean Phillips, to uh, Justin Houston and Tom Ali, to the Von Millers, to, to Chubbs, all those guys. They all have great pass rushers. So you have to give them different looks every single time you get a chance to. So from running backs to tight ends, making sure you chip them, and not just chipping them, uh, you know, in vain, but making sure they feel you, make sure they get a different look. It helps your offensive line get set up, gives them a different look, makes them think. Um, you know, in a nutshell, it keeps the defense honest. So actors have the Academy Awards. Football players have the Pro Bowl. Give me a story or two about getting accepted into that fraternity, and what did that mean to you and your family? Uh, it, meant, it meant a great deal to me. I was an alternate twice before I made my first, my first one out of four. It was just, it was just awesome, uh, not only for me as an individual, but a few times I was the only Raider to make it. And it was great to be able to represent the Raider organization, the Raider family, uh, and the entire Raider nation in that special game amongst, you know, the, the, the 22 great players of this league. So it's something that, that my, myself and my family will always remember forever. What do these great fans mean to you, the great fans of the Silver and Black? Listen, I've said it a ton of times, the Raider Nation is second to none. Uh, we always appreciate them as players, um, as, as alumni. We feed off their energy, and we would be nowhere without them. So to the Raider Nation, thank you. Well, not only thank you, but this is the perfect way to wrap this up and get these fans going. Raider Nation, are you ready for football in London? Okay, okay, listen, listen. From myself, the entire Raider Nation, we don't take you guys being here for granted. We know the Raider Nation is second to none, so we want to thank you all for coming out, supporting us, and let you know that we appreciate every little bit of you. And we want to end this the right way. Lincoln, where you at? How are we going to end it? If you're ready for some Raider football UK style, let me hear you say Raider! Raider!